Warning, this video may contain content that may not be suitable for children or anyone else that is easily offended. Strong language, graphic content, nudity, bad jokes, and a possible idiot, aka myself, may be featured in the following clip. Viewer discretion is advised. You're not responsible for any damages that you receive watching this video. <laughs> y'all it's zims and i am back with another video man thank you guys so much for all the recent support and understanding my uh, place and being on deployment thank you guys so much man we're right around the corner from 4,000. even when i wasn't posting you guys are still showing support man thank you guys so much for that really really appreciate it but i am back aka red flag king aka hell no aka couldn't be me aka why would you do that aka put up signs aka read the signs aka let's get it if you're not hype right now, you in the wrong place. Today's story involves one of the most graphic and upsetting sequences I've ever covered on any story. It also involves harm to minors, so viewer discretion is advised. But before, before we, we get, get into, into today's story, story if, if you're a fan of this strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, format then you come to the right place, because that's, that's all we do when you upload two or, or three times every week. week. So if that's of interest to you, please sneak into the like button's house in the middle of the night and unplug their iPhone in the middle of a software update. Software. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. Mr. Paul Dance, have you forgotten? No matter where I am, all over the world, mm -hmm. let's go. Five hacks. Warning, disturbing images and statements for your discretion advisor. In the 1960s and 1970s, hitchhiking became very popular amongst young people in America. Good hitchhiking is a form of transportation where you basically get rides from strangers. And so the way it works is a hitchhiker will stand on the side of a busy road and they'll extend their arm out and they'll kind of hold their thumb up, which signals to passing motorists that they want to hitchhike. That's the kind of universal sign for hitchhiking. And then a willing motorist, when they see a hitchhiker, they'll pull up alongside and offer a ride. Now, today, it seems unfathomably dangerous to just hop into a stranger's car or conversely, for a motorist to pick up a random stranger Thanks. on the side of the road. But back then, this was considered totally normal and socially acceptable. But a lot of stuff back then was normal and not seem weird, like, like hell no, bro. It's a universal way for transportation and it's the universal way to see God. It's the universal way to see your fastest way to get kidnapped or worse, never hitchhike, man. If you have to walk and use your Subarus, then I by all God, man, do it because um, hitchhike is not the way to go. And so with that in mind, on September 29th, 1978, a 15 year old girl named Mary Vincent was standing on the side of a highway just outside of Modesto, California, which is not far from San Francisco, California. Mary was a rebellious teenager who had recently run away from her home in Las Vegas, Nevada. Her parents were going through a very nasty divorce and she just couldn't stand to be in the house anymore. And so that's why she had run away. And so she had hitchhiked all the way up to Los Angeles, California, Damn. where her grandfather lived. But after only being there for a couple of days, she became unbelievably homesick and wanted to go back and be around her parents and her family. I believe it. And so one day when her grandfather was out, she slipped out of his house and she began hitchhiking back to Las Vegas. Red Nevada. flag. And so she had hitchhiked from Los Angeles to Modesto, California. That's where the first person was willing to drive her to. And so she was on that strip of highway in Modesto looking for another ride that could take her farther south. She was on this highway with two other young hitchhikers. They all had these signs that said going south. So they weren't just holding their thumbs out. They were holding these signs. And so the three of them are huddled in a group. They're holding their signs up. And at some point mid afternoon, this light blue passenger van that only had one passenger. It was the driver. He was a 50 something year old man. He looked pretty harmless. He pulled over when he saw their signs and he parked on the side of the road maybe 15 feet ahead of where they were. If you see a van like that, I know it's kind of faded like that, but if you see that old fashioned 19, whatever it is, ice cream truck, there's no, hell no, man. He said, look, he's 50. It looked like he wouldn't hurt a fly. Those are usually the ones that you're you that doing the weird shit, man. You don't see like people like me, the chocolate handsome, chisel chin on the side and I'll play. But you usually don't see those kind of people doing it. I mean, unless you're like Ted Bundy or Jeffrey Dahmer or somebody else that was one of like, or Richard Ramirez, a lot of people say he was attractive as a killer. But usually it's the ones that you're like, what, he did that? I would have never thought. Yeah, it's them, bro. The Ned Flander type serial killers are the ones that's doing the serial killing, bro. Do you ever sit there and imagine like how many serial killers I walk past or how many serial killers that I've talked to or 
how many people in my family are killers I don't even know about it. Those are things that you should be asking yourself right now if you haven't already. Think about that. So Mary's companions stayed where they were and Mary ran up to this light blue van and she looked through the passenger side window which had been rolled down and she asked this guy, hey, can you give all three of us a ride? We're going south. And this man, he would look at her and say, I can only give you a ride. Hell I can't no. give the other two a ride. Red I can flag. only give you a ride. And so Mary is confused because she's looking at this guy and she's seeing all this space in his van. And she's thinking to herself, you know, why am I only allowed to go when they're going the same place I'm going and there's plenty of room in this van? But when she kind of gently prodded this man and said, well, you know, are you sure you don't, you don't mind taking them too? He just said, look, I will take you. I will not take them. And so Mary said, okay, well, hold on. Let me go back and get my bag. Oh, my and So he Lord. stays parked. She leaves the van and she runs back to the other two people she was with. And, you know, she explains the situation and they tell her, you know, Mary, this is not good. There's mm -hmm. clearly something off with this guy. But Mary, even though she too shared this kind of reservation about this guy, she was so desperate to get home. She was so homesick that she couldn't face the idea of having to wait around for another ride, oh, which wait. might not come until the next day or the day yeah. after because not every motorist is willing to pick up hitchhikers mm -hmm. and she just did not want to wait any longer and so she told her companions that guys i'm gonna take the ride and so she says goodbye to her two friends she grabs her bag and she runs back up to the van and she hops in the passenger mm -hmm. seat as soon as she sat down and closed the door mm -hmm. this man pulled back out onto the road and started driving and then he turned and looked at mary and introduced himself his name was lawrence singleton and he was 50 years old and then mary you know she introduced herself and then they have some small talk and very quickly mary feels at ease around lawrence he kind of reminded her of her grandfather he was very nice very polite and so when she started to feel tired pretty early on in their trip, she said, hey, Lawrence, do you mind if I doze off while you drive? And Lawrence would say, no problem. Go ahead, go to sleep. Mm -mm. And so Mary turned away from Lawrence and kind of curled up on the seat and pretty quickly she was asleep. A little while later, when she woke up, she looked out the window and immediately could tell they were going the wrong way. So she turns to Lawrence and says, you know, we're going the wrong way. And Lawrence would say, oh, you know what? I, I made a mistake. I I'll get us turned around. You know, sorry about that. I, I, I had no idea. But Mary's thinking to herself, we're really far mm -hmm. in the wrong direction. And there's no way he accidentally did this. But she kind of bit her tongue because Lawrence would actually turn around and start going in the right direction. And so they're traveling in the proper direction for a little while and Mary's totally on edge, but she's careful not to give that off to Lawrence because she doesn't really know this guy. And even though he did make her feel comfortable, she just doesn't really know what his intentions are. And so she's just kind of looking around pretty apprehensively. And then they pull into this stretch of highway that kind of ran through this fairly forested area where very few cars were on this stretch of road and Lawrence suddenly tells Mary that he wants to pull over because he has to go to the bathroom. He wants Hell nah, bro. You was not about to pull over in a secluded area and tell me you have to use the restroom, bro. You had all that time to use the restroom when I was asleep and you was heading in the wrong direction. I mean, the red flags are everywhere. Obviously, Mr. Ballnard went over that. Back then, people were more comfortable with getting hitchhiking rides. But my thing is, if you felt uncomfortable, the two people you with, like, nah, bro, I don't do it. You got a big ass damn van and you can't give the other two people a ride, but you wanna go give the female a ride? Mm, that's kind of suspicious, sus, red flags. I wouldn't do it, me personally. Just thinking about it and just hearing it. If two people are telling me don't do it and I feel it inside of myself saying not to do it, then I wouldn't do it, but that's just me. And on top of that, uh, how do you forget I'm going south? We was holding up signs the whole time saying that we're going south. He's like, oh, I forgot, I made a mistake. And then it wasn't that, you know, he found it and corrected it. She woke up as he was turning around. Like he was going someplace else. Like he was taking her somewhere. This Lawrence dude, man. Please trust your instinct. I know we go over this all the time. It's been a while, but if something feels wrong, don't go. If your friends are going to a party and you don't feel right about the party, don't go. If you're at school and it's like, hey, let's go hang out and over here at nighttime, don't go. Like, just don't do it. If they say, oh, you missed out, hey, you just missed out. You'll live another day. Them bonfires, wherever it is, ain't going nowhere. Trust your instinct because you're usually nine times out of ten is correct. Mary kind of apprehensively says, yeah, okay, that's fine. And so as Lawrence is beginning to pull off of the highway, Mary happens to look down at her feet and she notices one of her shoes is untied. And instinctually, Mary just thought to herself, I better make sure that shoe gets tied because I might need to run away from this guy. Mm -hmm. But she didn't want to reach down and start tying her shoe. It was kind of awkward because the space was small and she was worried it would be kind of suspicious if she did it. And so she thought, okay, as soon as we pull off, I'll get out of the car and I'll tie my shoe. 
And so Lawrence, he pulls over, but he doesn't just pull over onto the shoulder of this road. He drives it. Instead, he pulls into this access road that kind of trails into the forest. And so as soon as he turned onto this road, the alarm bells are going off in Mary's head. She knows something is wrong, but she doesn't really know what to say to Lawrence because he's not talking to her and she doesn't really want to look at him. And so what? she's just kind of going over in her head what she's going to do. Is she going to run? Is she going to confront him? She doesn't know. And then eventually, after about a minute or so, when they are far enough away from the main road that no one on that road could see them, they're pretty far into this forest, Lawrence stops the car and he hops out to go relieve himself. And immediately, Mary, she hops out of the car too and she bends down to tie her shoe. Before she could finish tying her shoe, suddenly something smacked her hard in the back of the head and it knocked her unconscious. It was Lawrence. He had hid a hammer next to his seat. And when he had gotten out, he did not go relieve himself. Instead, he walked around the vehicle and smashed her in the head. When Mary came to, she realized she was laying down in the back of the van. And as she was looking out the windows, she could see that they were still parked out in the middle of the forest. And then when she tried to move, she realized her hands, her feet, everything had been tied down to the van. She couldn't move. And so as she's wondering what's going on, Lawrence comes around, he opens the back doors to this van, he hops inside, and he begins assaulting her. Mary has no idea what to do. She's a 15-year-old kid, and this guy is on top of her, he's not stopping. And so she just began quietly begging him to please stop, set me free, I won't tell anyone. She just kept repeating that over and over and over again, and Lawrence never spoke back, he just continued the assault for hours and hours. Jesus Finally, Christ. when Lawrence got tired, he got off of Mary and he climbed out of the back of the truck and he went around and he climbed into one of the front seats and he fell asleep. And so Mary probably tried to free herself from her restraints, but there was nothing she could do. The restraints were tied too tightly. And so for hours, she must have just laid there wondering what was gonna happen to her. And then at some point in the middle of the night, Lawrence wakes up again and without saying a word to Mary, he just climbs out of the van and gets into the driver's seat and then drives the van out of the forest. He drives on the main road for a little while until he turns down another access road that takes them away from the main road so away from any prying eyes and he comes to a stop somewhere out in this forest in the middle of this big canyon. Lawrence parks the van, he climbs out and walks around to the back, he opens up the back doors where Mary is laying there whimpering and crying and begging to be set free. He climbs inside and her torture continues for hours and hours until the sun finally came up. At which point Lawrence stopped, he climbed out of the back of the van and he's standing out there and he turns around so he's facing Mary and he reaches in and he undoes her restraints. So he frees her, he pulls her out of the van and stands her up on the ground. And so she's crying, she's beaten, she's bloodied, she doesn't know what's going on. And she just gently says to him, please set me free. And he says, oh, you want to be set free? I'll set you free. And so he walks around this totally destroyed 15 year old girl and he reaches into the back of his van where there's this toolbox and he pulls out a hatchet. And so he walks back and he's standing in front of Mary and Mary would have had a fraction of a second to see what was in his hand before in one fluid motion, he reaches and grabs her left arm with his left hand. He grabs her on the wrist, then he raises his hatchet up and he brings it down on her left forearm, severing her arm off right below the elbow. This mo, oh my God. Man, I don't understand how scary this is, bro. Like some people, like just imagine just being in her shoes. Like you can't ask for help. You're tied up. You don't know where you are. It's you and a 50 year old man. She's 15 and he, he's at least got, a, from the picture he looked like, at least had like 150 pounds on her, bro, easily. And he's really just beating her up and he just has no remorse. Who beats somebody and tortures them and then goes to sleep in the driver's seat? This lets me know he's done this before. I don't know if he's a serial killer or he's just living out some fantasy or what, but like how sick do you have to be to kill or beat somebody up torture him and then go like, well, you know what? I'm tired. I'm about to go to sleep in the front seat while the person, the victim in the back seat bleeding and bruised. And then I'm gonna wake up and finish doing what I'm doing. Like what? And then on top of that, he un, he cuts her hands off and he grabs her arm and he chops her arm. Why? Man, this is crazy. This, people are evil like this, man. That's what we're telling you guys, man. You gotta stay strapped. Knife, a taser, 
pepper spray something, man. I know she probably didn't have access to that stuff, but this is why I tell you guys to stay strapped, man. You never know. People be walking up on you in houses and in the woods, on the streets. Daylight now, too. People don't care if it's daylight outside. I remember back then, people used to wait till it's night. Nah, man, they wait. They don't care if it's daytime, nighttime, bruh, evening. They do not care, bruh. Don, they, they're gonna take what's theirs. If they have the cue to get it, then it is what it is. So you, you gotta protect yourself and think about all that other forgiveness stuff and everything else later. So Mary falls backwards to the ground mm. and she looks down at where her left arm just was she's in shock and before she can do anything Lawrence just walks over and with his left hand again he reaches over and grabs her right wrist and now Mary knows what he's about to do he's still holding this hatchet and so she's screaming and she's kicking him as hard as she can to try to get him off of her but his grip is too strong and then he begins to chop at her right forearm over and over again. It would take four hard blows to finally sever her right arm mm. off of her body. And so Mary falls to the ground in a heap. She's bleeding profusely. She's screaming in agonizing pain. And all Lawrence can focus on is that one of Mary's amputated hands was clutched on to his left arm. When he cut off her left hand, it had gripped onto his arm and now it was stuck to him. And so very nonchalantly, he began trying to flick this hand off of his arm and then finally when it did come off he turned and looked at Mary and realized she had gone silent and she was limp and she was laying in a huge pool of blood and so Lawrence put the bloody hatchet back inside of his van and then he just walked over to Mary and grabbed her and began dragging her about a hundred feet down the road from the van was a culvert a culvert is a big tunnel mm -hmm. that goes underneath roads. It allows water and runoff to pass by the road without damaging it. And so this particular culvert underneath this access road was built about 30 feet below the surface of the road. And so if you were standing on the road over the area where this culvert was, if you walked to the edge of the road on either side, there would be a 30 foot drop off down to the opening of this culvert on either side. And so Lawrence dragged Mary all the way over to this section of the road Jesus over the shit. culvert and then chucked her lifeless body off the side, smashing it down onto the rocks below. And then Lawrence walked around very carefully all the way down to her body and stuffed her inside of the actual culvert. And then as he was walking away, he said to her, now you're free. After Lawrence left, Mary should have been dead. Really, she should have died at several points along this attack. But miraculously, Mary did not die. There we and go. In fact, she would later say she vividly remembered the entire attack. She was fully lucid, fully conscious, fully aware for the entire thing, save for the moment when she was knocked unconscious by the hammer. And so she yeah. vividly remembered having her arms amputated, and she specifically remembered one particular point in the beginning before her left arm, the first arm, had been amputated. He grabbed her left wrist, and she in turn instinctively grabbed with her left hand onto his left arm. So she's clutching onto him. And so when he came down and cut her arm off, she began falling backwards. But she remembered thinking to herself, why am I falling backwards? I just grabbed onto his arm. I had a firm grip. And then as she's falling, it's like time is standing still. She literally saw her hand still clutching his arm and saw it had been cut off of her body. And then when Lawrence cut off her right arm, despite being in agonizing pain, it's like she instinctively understood that she has to pretend to be dead. Otherwise, she will die. And so she went totally limp, her eyes were half open, and she watched as Lawrence is flicking her left hand, the one that she thought she had gripped onto when she was falling back. She watched as he shook that hand off of his arm. And then she was limp as he grabbed her and dragged her the 100 feet to the culvert. And she was limp and still and didn't make a sound when he threw her 30 feet down onto jagged rocks and she broke four of her ribs. She was in excruciating pain, but her will to survive was telling her, make no sound, take this punishment and you will survive. Yo, that's, man, I was just about to say that, bro. Her will, her determination, dude, that was a straight willpower, bro. You telling me you cut off both of her arms and threw her 30 feet and she still didn't make no sound? You it, Even me, when I jumped like 10 feet down to somewhere, I hit the ground like, mm, you know, make a, some kind of grunt, nothing. She broke some ribs and still didn't scream. This girl right here, man. And the fact that she like, was able to live and tell her story, because some people wouldn't be able to tell the story. They'll be so traumatized and don't want to relive through the moment but if she didn't survive we probably would never heard these stories Dude, a lot of times back then in these days most of the killers were never caught 
You think I'm capping? Go back and Google and research some of these killers. It was so easy to get away with murder back then. Super easy until DNA and stuff start coming in and fingerprints and all that stuff is when they start catching people. Back then, anybody could have been a serial killer and you would not know it because the, the technology available was like slim. Man, my, my hat's off to her because I'm sitting here thinking about it. I couldn't do nothing like that, man. I, I'd have been screaming in pain. I don't think I could have, but then again, I haven't been in that situation, so who knows? I'm shocked that he threw her 30 feet. She'd embrace herself, like head, everything, body, all that hit the rocks at the bottom, 30 feet, and then dragged her. Dang, and if she would've just made one grunt or one sound or gargle or anything, anything like that, man, she'd have been finished. Then after he left, she remembers thinking, you know, I don't know where he is. Oh, she's she could pretty. be waiting up on the road for me. I can't just crawl out and try to save myself because then he might actually finish me off. And so she laid in this culvert in this horrible position, totally contorted with her arms gone and broken ribs. And then finally, after a while, she started to feel exceptionally tired. And that was from blood loss. And she said there was a voice in her head telling her, you can't go to sleep. If you go to sleep, you're gonna die. And if you die, we can't catch this monster and he's gonna do this to someone else. Told you. And so she had the surge of adrenaline where she decided, I'm gonna live, I'm gonna get out of here. I don't know if he's still up there, but I have to get out and I have to try to save myself. And so somehow she got out of the culvert. And then once she was on the ground, she dug the nubs of her arms into the dirt and attempted to pack the wound with dirt and mud. And then afterwards, she raised her arms up over her head because she didn't want the blood and muscles to fall out. And so with her mutilated arms up over her head, she managed to crawl up this embankment up onto the road. She's got no clothes on. She's covered head to toe in blood. She's in shock. And she starts running down the highway. And a car would actually come by fairly quickly. But they were so startled at what they were seeing, they didn't stop. And they drove on. Yeah. And so Mary would ultimately run through three miles on this highway before finally flagging down a passing motorist. It happened to be a young couple. And after they got over the initial shock of what Mary actually looked like, they put her inside of their car and they sped to the hospital. Mary would stay in the hospital for a month. And during that time, she would give police all this information about her attacker, about Lawrence Singleton. And using her very detailed description of him, the police were able to come up with a very good composite sketch. And Lawrence Singleton's neighbor happened to see that sketch mm -hmm. and they turned him in. Lawrence was ultimately sentenced to 14 years in prison for what he did to Mary. It was the maximum sentence that the judge could give. The judge wanted to do more, but legally they couldn't. And so Mary, she testified at court. And so after it all ended and he was sentenced, Mary was leaving the courthouse. And as she passed by Lawrence, it was the one time she had to be physically close to him. He turned and kind of leaned into her and said, I will finish the job if it takes me the rest of my life. Eight years later, Lawrence was paroled for good behavior. And so of course, this terrified Mary, who by now had become a wife and she had two sons. And so she's worried that now that this guy is free, he's gonna come and finish the job. But Lawrence would not go after Mary. Instead, 10 years after he got out on parole, he would attack another woman, a 31-year-old mother of three named Roxanne Hayes. And unfortunately, he would kill her. Do you see what I mean, man? I'm tired and I'm tired and tired of seeing these videos and not just Mr. Ball, like these, like this justice system, what the hell? 14 years? He kidnapped her, beat her up, tied her up, cut her arms off, threw her 30 feet, cracked her ribs, tried to dispose of the body and then drove off. Fleeing the crime scene too, and you give him 14 years? I wish I could have given more, but I can't. And then you're gonna parole him eight years later for good behavior? Did you forget why he was in there in the first place? He's a killer. He's a serial killer. And God knows how many times he's done it. This is the first time he's getting caught because he was comfortable with doing it. Ain't nobody riding across the country with an empty ass van that big. Like, come on, bro. Aim. Let's, wow. And then look, got her killed, bro, because the criminal justice system was still booty. I mean, it's a little bit better, but it's still but today, like 100%. None of the stuff that happens makes sense. The, the sentencing doesn't make sense. The sentencing is based on the judge opinion and the judge feelings and emotions. It's just like, it's not a standard. It's just, I want you to do this amount of time, this much. Uh, this, if you do good, I'm gonna let you out. Like, no, it's that. I, <laughs> I came back to reaction videos and I just remember how much Jesus pissed me off. But Roxanne Hayes, man, rest in peace to her. Killed her. And then he leaned over in the courtroom and said, I'm gonna finish the job. 
you can't tackle no more years for that. Like, okay, he did 14 and then give him an additional 14. You get what I'm saying? So make him do 14 and give him an additional 14. Why couldn't you do that? That's wild, man. I don't, oh my Lord, bro. Roxanne's murder trial, Mary would actually testify against Lawrence and her testimony is what they used to secure a death sentence for Lawrence. But you should have did that in the first place. Before he could be executed, Lawrence died of cancer in jail in 2001. When Mary heard that Lawrence had died, she felt very cheated. However, her sons were very relieved to find out that her attacker had died, and so she took some solace in that. Outrage over Lawrence's early release, considering what he did to Mary, and the fact that that early release led to another person being killed, led to the creation of the Lawrence Singleton Bill, which gives judges the ability to give 25 years year to life sentences in cases that involve bro look at this dude like the dude i'm like nah so you ain't get him see oh god you pay you tuesday for a hamburger today <laughs> popeye head ass boy oh, he looked like a cartoon character is this even real look like willis and gromit where's that that one popeye bro like i oh, don't know bro but he didn't eat no spinach he don't even look real. He look like an imaginary friend or some shit. I'm gonna end it right here, guys. Thank you guys so much for stopping by and watching this video. This video is by Mr. Ball. And if you haven't already, be sure you sweep down the description box. Go on a link, go watch the bills in entirety because I was pausing to stop and it fucking do the whole thing. Thank you guys so much for all that you do. Keep doing what you guys are doing and the videos will keep coming. Let me know down in the comment section what you thought of this video. It's kind of like, I don't know how to say it. It's kind of like I'm mad that she got in the car with them, but I'm also happy that she did because they probably wouldn't have caught him. Wish that no one had to go through that, but I think Mary was chosen to catch this dude because if not, I think he would have still been out there because I'm pretty sure all the victims that he had didn't survive. Yeah, but let me know down in the comment section what you guys think. Uh, but again, thank you guys for watching and I'll see you guys next time.